Welcome to Asbury. I'm Kip Rose and I'm one of the pastors here. It's great to have you join us. A man goes to an attorney's office seeking legal advice. He has some questions. He says to the lawyer, how much would it cost me to ask you a few questions? The lawyer says, well, I charge $400 for three questions. That's a bit expensive, isn't it? Yes. What's your third question? Imagine a world without questions, without mystery, without curiosity. It would, be, it would be hard to grow in a world like that because questions push us forward into new understandings and reflection and discovery. You see it all the time in children. Kids ask a lot of questions. Some studies show four-year-olds ask as many as 200 to 300 questions a day. Warren Berger, author of A More Beautiful Question, says kids ask an average of 40,000 questions between the ages of two and five. Berger also found that the years that follow as kids go to school, the number of questions they ask decline. There's a few reasons. It's exhausting for parents to answer so many. Teachers have to make sure kids know answers and asking questions can sometimes be associated with not knowing something might be perceived as, as not so good. However, asking questions is essential to learning and it's something kids do naturally. Curiosity and questions are sort of baked into the human experience. Kids encounter something new, learn a little bit about it, they get curious, they continue to add a little more information, and it opens up their lives, it opens up learning. Questions are important. Questions can lead to growth. Questions push us forward into new understandings and discovery. And maybe that's why Jesus was so fond of asking questions. The Gospels record 307 questions that Jesus asked others. In contrast, people asked Jesus 183 questions. Do you know how many of those questions Jesus directly answered? He only answered three. It seems that Jesus preferred to ask questions rather than to provide direct answers. Well, today we begin a new series, Questions Jesus Asked. We're gonna explore five crucial questions that Jesus posed. Our series is based on a book by Pastor McGray de Vega. And the questions you'll hear over the next few weeks sort of get at the heart what it means to be human. Why are you afraid? What do you live for? Whom will you love? What are you looking for? And who do you say that Jesus is? Often spiritual growth happens when we're honest with God about our questions, but we can even learn from the questions that Jesus asks of us. So my hope and prayer is that during this series, it will help us ask and answer these questions for ourselves so that we can live life as God intends. Today's question from Jesus is a foundational question. Who do you say that I am? How you answer that question determines more than just your belief about Jesus. It reveals something about what you believe about yourself, your relationship with Christ, and your perspective on life. Let me read the story. It's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I'm gonna read Luke's version. It's from Luke chapter nine. Once when Jesus was praying alone with only the disciples near him, he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others that one of the ancient prophets has arisen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered, the Messiah of God. Jesus sternly ordered and commanded them not to tell anyone saying, the son of man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Then he said to them all, if any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit them if they gain the whole world, but lose or forfeit themselves? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Indeed, truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Jesus' question to his disciples, Peter's answer, and Jesus' response is a turning point in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
After this, there's the story of Jesus' transfiguration on the mountain. And from there, we see the second half of Jesus' ministry, which leads him to Jerusalem, to his arrest, his trial, and his crucifixion. Who do you say that I am? The events leading up to Jesus' question differ slightly depending on which gospel account you read. In Matthew and Mark, Jesus posed the question as the disciples are passing through the villages near the city of Caesarea Philippi. He had just fed the crowd with a few loaves and fish. He was questioned by the Pharisees as a way to try to trap him, and he healed the blind man. Jesus and his disciples are now in the busy crowds near one of the largest cities in the north. Lots of activity, lots of people, lots of noise. That is the setting of the question for Matthew and Mark's gospel. Luke tells the story a bit differently. In Luke, Jesus is alone. He had fed the multitudes and then went off to pray. In Luke, the setting is a pause, a breath, a moment of reflection for Jesus and for those of us who are reading. It's the same question asked, but two different situations. There is the busyness of Matthew and Mark and the quiet and stillness in Luke. And Pastor De Vega points out that both are occasions when we might encounter that key question of the faith. Who do you say that I am? We ask deep questions when life is busy and noisy. In the hustle and bustle of day-to-day -day living with the pressure of deadlines, the to-do list that never seems to get shorter even no matter how much you check off, we wonder, is it worth it? Amid the noise of competing perspectives, political division, polarizing discourse, violence and warfare, fractured relationships, we wonder, whose voice should I listen to? We ask deep questions amid the noise of life. We ask equally deep questions when life is quiet. In the stillness of the night when you can't sleep, your eyes are open, your mind is racing, we ask ourselves, what's the meaning of it all? In our most honest prayers, we cry out to God from the deep parts of our souls. Who are you? Where are you? Who am I? In busyness or stillness, we may very well ponder the questions that matter most. In Luke, Jesus is alone and in prayer, but he's interrupted as he often was, but Jesus turns the interruption into a chance to ask his disciples a crucial question. Jesus speaks first, who do the crowds say that I am? And the disciples give a few answers. John the Baptist. Well, Jesus was like John the Baptist. He had a voice calling people to repentance, action, and a new way of life. But he was more than that. Some said Elijah. Yes, he was like Elijah. Jesus was not afraid to challenge those in power. He was always ready to help the poor and vulnerable. But Jesus was more than that. Some said one of the ancient prophets. Well, yes, he was like the prophets who spoke for God, calling people to obedience and surrender. But Jesus was much more than that as well. It turns out that the question was just, that question was just a setup for the most important question Jesus would ask his disciples and us. And what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter's answer is clear. The Messiah of God. Other versions say the Christ sent from God. Jesus was God, anointed by God, sent by God. The most important question Jesus asks is answered correctly by Peter. But with Jesus, we discover that the right answer is not always the complete answer. Remember how Jesus asked the question, who do you, who do you say that I am? To answer it fully and completely, we need to decide what impact the answer will make on our lives. Jesus isn't simply looking for the right words. It's, it's more than that. We're told Jesus sternly ordered and commanded them not to tell anyone, and then he taught them that he must suffer and die, and on the third day he would be raised. Basically, he's saying, I am the Christ, I am sent from God, but there, there's more to it. In fact, don't say a word to anyone about your answer to my question because the answer is incomplete. It's only partially right. It's a good start, but there's more. There's more to know. Peter has the right answer, but does he have the full answer? 
Does Peter understand what it means that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the anointed one sent from God? Is Peter envisioning a king ruling on earth from a throne? That's how many people pictured the Messiah, the anointed, the Christ, a king who would come to restore the fortunes of Israel, bring in an army and take over. Peter has the right answer, but does he have the full answer? Jesus goes on to tell them that if you really believe he's the Christ of God, then everything in your life ought to change. You need to say no to yourself, take up your cross daily, follow Jesus. Pastor Ben Kramer put it this way. He said, the greatest display of power by God came from a wash basin and a cross, not a throne and a sword. You need to lose your life in order to save it. Gaining the whole world no longer matters. The only thing that matters is that your entire life is moving toward living out the kingdom of God. So Jesus starts to teach the full answer to Peter's right answer. There's a scene in the 2006 movie, Talladega Nights, The Ballad of Ricky Bobby. That humorous scene depicts how we often view God on our own terms that we view God too narrowly. The scene is a family dinner table of a NASCAR driver and lead character, Ricky Bobby, played by Will Ferrell. He's at the dinner table with his wife and kids, his father-in-law and his best friend, Cal. Ricky begins to offer grace for the meal with these words. Dear Lord, baby Jesus. And then he can, continues repeating a version of dear baby Jesus or dear tiny infant Jesus. And Ricky's wife, Carly, interrupts. She says, hey, um, you know, sweetie, Jesus did grow up. You don't have to always call him baby. It's a bit, bit odd and off-putting to pray to a baby. Ricky, Ricky responds, well, look, I like the Christmas Jesus best, and I'm saying grace. When you say grace, you can say it to the grown-up Jesus or teenage Jesus or bearded Jesus or whoever you want. Eventually, Ricky's friend Cal says, well, I like to picture Jesus in a tuxedo t-shirt because it says, like, I want to be formal, but I'm here to party too. Because I like to party, so I like my Jesus to party. One of Ricky's little boys says, I like to picture Jesus as a ninja fighting off evil samurai. And Ricky concludes, dear eight pound, six ounce, newborn infant Jesus, don't even know a word yet, just a little infant so cuddly, but still omnipotent. We just thank you for all the races I've won and for the $21.2 million that I've accrued over this past season. Thank you for all your power and grace, dear baby God, amen. We might laugh at the scene and the unusual prayer and conversation, but are we ever like Ricky Bobby? How often do we want to picture and pray to whatever Jesus we like best? And then when life throws a curveball at us, you know, moments of, loss, grief, suffering, and the God we have in mind feels inadequate to the challenge of the moments, then we're, then we're left struggling. And it's in those moments when Jesus asks us, who do you say that I am now? Those can be profound moments of growth in faith and deeper understanding. And it's not that the question has a different answer than the one Peter gave. Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the one sent from God. But it's our understanding of what that answer means and how it impacts our lives that makes a difference. Who do you say that I am? How we answer that question has huge consequences. All we have to do is remember that the same Christian religion that formed Mother Teresa and Billy Graham also reared Adolf Hitler. Same Christian church that has built hospitals, schools, and social services around the world also brought the Inquisition and the Crusades and the persecution of some of the greatest thinkers throughout history. Yes, it's important to answer the question correctly, who do you say that I am, the Messiah of God? But it is also important to answer it justly. What difference does our answer make in how we live and act in the world? What impact will my answer make in my life? Years ago, I read a little verse by uh, Wilbur Rees entitled, Three Dollars Worth of God. It came to my mind this week as I was reflecting on what it means to answer Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? And how we can give the right answer, but it might not be the full answer. 
the, the phrase goes like this, this reading goes like this. I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, just, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk and a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough God to make me love a black man or pick beats with a migrant. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Someone took the, that little verse, those phrases, and made it into a little skit. As a person enters a store and the clerk asks what he needs, and the man says, $3 worth of God. Well, are you sure you only want $3 worth of God? Yes. No more, no less. Just enough to be convenient, not overwhelming. I don't want any great changes in my life, just $3 worth of God. I don't want God to become a problem for me. And the clerk asks, well, what do you mean a problem? Well, why, I want enough God so I feel reassured in case of an emergency. I want to have God in my back pocket. I want God there for weddings and baptisms, but I don't need it in everything I do. Sort of an insurance policy, comforting like a warm blanket or a cup of hot chocolate. But if there's emergency, I want enough to get by. Have you thought of a larger dose of God? Asks the clerk. Do you have any idea how cumbersome it would be to have more than $3 worth of God in my life? I don't want enough to have to love people who make me angry or who have hurt me. I don't want to have, have to like some immigrants or homeless. And I certainly don't want to have to think about depressing things like climate change, human trafficking, children being hungry or cold. No, no, that would mean I might have to do something. I'd have to get involved and, and that would mean I couldn't buy and do what I want when I want to buy and do something. Instead, I'd have to, I'm not looking for transformation. I just want to feel good, a little safety and security. I'm not looking for struggle. I'm not looking for sacrifice. I just want $3 worth of God. The clerk says, okay, $3 worth of God, but I can guarantee there'll be no change for your purchase. There will be no change. The late Peter Gomes, author and professor at Harvard Divinity School, wrote a book called The Scandalous Gospel of Jesus. What's so good about the good news? And in it he said the question should not be what would Jesus do, but rather more dangerously, what would Jesus have me do? The onus is not on Jesus, but on us. For Jesus did not come to ask semi-divine human beings to do impossible things. He came to ask human beings to live up to their full humanity. He wants us to live in the full implication of our human gifts. And that is far more demanding. Pastor, De Pastor DeBega in his book writes, to say that Jesus is the Messiah of God is to intentionally follow the life and example that Jesus gave us and to love as God loves. It's to be governed by a heart of generosity, empathy, and compassion toward others. It is to take the principles of the Sermon on the Mount as difficult and even as irrational as they may seem and adopt them as a guide for living and relating to others. It is to seek the way of peace over violence, to seek the expansion of God's hospitality to those who feel rejected, shunned, ignored, and even harmed by past experiences with the church. We do this so that others can hear Jesus ask them the same question, who do you say that I am? Answer it for themselves and discover the life that God has always intended for them. Jesus can transform our hearts and shape our behavior when we offer ourselves to him fully. Jesus can align our priorities with God's best intentions for the world. Jesus can offer peace and hope when we're suffering and struggling. And Jesus can guide us as a people of God toward acts of compassion, healing, and love instead of violence, cruelty, and hatred. Jesus is the Christ sent from God, the Messiah of God, in us, through us, and for the world. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, thank you for sending Jesus into the world as our Lord and as our Savior. 
Today, you come to us asking, who do you, who do, who do you, who do each one of us say that, that uh, your son is? Uh, by your grace, we, we answer that he is the son of God. He is your son. And uh, he is the one sent from you that uh, Jesus is God, Lord and Savior. And by your grace today, we pray, uh, Lord, that we might live out our beliefs in, in, the, in the world around us. We, we pray that our actions would reflect our confession. And we pray all of this. We pray for the power of your spirit to help us with this, all of this, in Jesus' name. Amen.